good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever or whenever you happen to be viewing this. An important tool of data science is statistics. In part one of this module, we focused on the general power of statistics to persuade and how one can easily be deceived by pseudo-statistics. In part two, we looked at the various shapes of some basic statistics to reveal what makes up a real statistic versus a pseudo-statistic. Here in part three of this module, we will look at the statistical concept of correlations, and that lends itself to a discussion of the scientific method, which is important to remember if data science is to truly be a science. Before proceeding, I would like to take a moment to thank the MAVO Institute for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. The MAVO Institute is the brainchild of Martin van der Heiden. I encourage you to take a moment to check out the MAVO Institute website as well as the team's profiles. One of Martin's key hopes is to tap experienced experts to address topics or problems at hand. As such, the team behind this presentation also includes John Murphy, a practicing tenured digital media executive, and myself, Dr. Paul Fielding. With that said, let's take a look at data science at statistics, part three, correlations and the scientific method. In the preceding section, we covered four key statistical shapes, the binomial or Bernoulli distribution, the normal distribution or bell curve, the Poissonian distribution, and the Pareto chart. In this section, we will take a look at the scatter diagram and curve fitting. Then we'll briefly discuss the scientific method in this context. Specifically, just because you can fit a line to a bunch of data, just because you have a correlation, that does not make something a scientific fact. What is the difference between something being statistically correlated and something being scientifically known. Originally, I was not going to cover the scatter diagram because it is actually a somewhat advanced concept and there are some subtle landmines that need to be navigated. But it also lends itself nicely to a discussion on the difference between something being statistically correlated versus something being scientifically known. And this is a point that the media and sometimes self-serving people have been known to overlook. Thus, in the field of data science, if indeed it is to be a science, this topic becomes worth understanding. So buckle yourself in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and let's look at the scatter diagram. Imagine a situation where you think we can control one variable by controlling something else. We think there is a relationship between these two things, but when we collect the data, the results seem scattered. If we plot this data, results in what is called a scatter diagram. Here we see the independent variable, the thing we think we can control, the thing that is independent of other factors. That is plotted on the horizontal axis, or what is typically called the x-axis. The dependent variable, the result, the output that depends on the thing that we are controlling, that is plotted on the vertical axis, or what is typically called the y-axis. Now suppose we use a single line to approximate this set of data. We draw this line right through the middle of the scatter of data points. Let's say we use this proposed line to represent our situation instead of the data. Then we are predicting that if we take a point on the independent variable and go up to our line and then look across to the dependent variable, we are predicting that will be the result. We see that there is an error between what our line predicts versus our actual data. Suppose we were to move the line about so as to minimize the error between each data point and our proposed line. When we find the line that minimizes all the errors, we might call this the best fit line. There is some complicated math involved to find out what is the best fit line. Fortunately, most spreadsheet programs and even many calculators have automated this process for you. But it is based on the idea that we start by taking all the errors between the proposed line versus the actual data points. Then we multiply those values by themselves. That is called taking the square of a number. When you do that, you only get positive values. A negative number times a negative number is a positive number, and a positive number times a positive number is a positive number. Then we add up all those numbers. That is to say, we take the sum of the squares of the errors. Then, like a good golf game, we try to find the line that minimizes that sum. 
the line that produces the smallest sum of the squared errors is considered to be the best bit line. Thus, this method is called the linear least squares method. Linear, meaning we are looking for a line. Least squares, meaning we are looking for the least value of the sum of the squares of the errors. Since this line only approximates the data, it is sometimes called a line estimate. So when using software to find the best bit line, you might find functions like LLS, line EST, which is an abbreviation for line estimate, and so on. By the way, every statistic includes something that will tell you about the shape of the data. Having a line that approximates the data is one thing, but how well does the line fit the data? How close are the data points to that line? Are they right up against the line, very close to the line? Or is the data all over the place? A value called R, sometimes called the correlation coefficient, tells you how well the data approximates your line or how well the data correlates with your line. This value is a bit like a sliding scale. The value of R can range from plus one to minus one. When the value is either near plus one or near minus one, it means that the actual data is very close to the line. However, if the value of R is near zero, then the data is less like a line and more like a random circle of points. It does not matter if the value of R is either negative or positive, but if it is closer to zero than it is closer to a one, a positive one or a minus one, then your data does not really form a very good line. So if someone is trying to sell you a solution based on correlational evidence, ask them about the correlation coefficient, the value of R. How good is that correlation? That is the first question to ask. We now need to take a moment to cautiously examine what is the significance of correlational evidence. Just because you have mathematically found a line that approximates your data, maybe you even have a very good value for R, a great correlation coefficient, a value that is close to either plus one or minus one. And maybe you have lots of data, big data, huge data. In these situations, it's very tempting for a data scientist to claim they have overwhelming correlational evidence does not mean you have scientific evidence. The two are not the same. Statistical data gives one a way to form a hypothesis, but the scientific process requires the hypothesis be independently tested. The scientific process requires one to construct an experiment where one actually manipulates the independent variable to show they can control the dependent variable. Without an experiment like that, the statistical correlation is just a hypothesis. Keep in mind, if the experiment produces results that disagree with the statistically formed hypothesis, then it does not matter how well you formed your hypothesis, how much data you use to form your statistical results, or how elegant your reasoning is. If the experimental results do not agree with your hypothesis, then true science admits it was wrong and goes back to analyzing the data to develop a new hypothesis to explain the phenomena being observed. Failure to take that next step, failure to independently test the hypothesis, has landed many an individual and even whole societies in the ditch thinking they knew what was happening based only on the correlational evidence, when in reality, all they had was a statistical artifact. For example, Imagine I have noticed that when people start using their lawnmowers, the weather gets hotter. I collect lots of data. With great alarm, I go to the city council and say, the mowing of lawns makes our summers hotter. Let's have cool summers. Let's ban the use of lawnmowers. I show them overwhelming data. Each summer, I rerun my analysis. I get great correlation coefficients. I claim this proves that as more lawnmowers are used, the weather gets hotter. The city council takes action and limits the use of lawnmowers. That is, we manipulate what I am claiming is the independent variable. The result, summer still comes again next year. How can this be? Bad science, even if done by good people, makes excuses. Good science makes no excuses. If the experiment, in this case, limiting the use of lawnmowers, does not produce data consistent with the hypothesis, 
then a good scientist recognizes the hypothesis is wrong. The use of lawnmowers might not be controlling the weather. Sure, this example might seem silly to you because you probably already guessed it is not the lawnmowers that are controlling the weather, but rather the weather that is influencing the use of lawnmowers. When the weather gets hotter, this makes the grass grow. So this makes people want to cut their lawns. The weather got hot during the summer long before the lawnmower was even invented. But this example is not as silly as you might think. When Torricelli was working to invent the barometer, a way to measure air pressure, his early versions used a column of water. He had not yet thought of using mercury, like what we are familiar with nowadays. Thus, he needed a very large apparatus, 13 times larger than one made with mercury. Water is much lighter than mercury, so the column of water needed to be much higher to equal the same weight of air above it. Thus, he constructed his water barometer in the town square where there was a tower he could use. Torricelli discovered that air pressure was not constant. He discovered that as bad weather systems approached, the air pressure would fall. He created a chart like a scatter diagram. He observed the correlation and realized the falling readings on his barometer could be used as a predictor of inclement weather. Unfortunately for Torricelli, the townspeople noticed the exact opposite correlation. They noticed that when the water in the barometer fell, it, that is the barometer, would bring them bad weather. So, in an effort to improve the weather of the town, the townspeople, filled with smart, righteous folks that claim to have scientific evidence on their side, but all they really had was correlational evidence, they made him take down his barometer in hopes of making the weather in the town better. Of course, barometers do not control the weather. Rather, the weather controls barometers. But people in that town would not concede to the scientific evidence. When they took down the barometer, that is, when they manipulated one variable, it did not change what they hypothesized was the dependent variable, the frequency of storms. Even when the experiment did not produce the desired results, rather than being true scientists and admitting they were wrong, they instead made excuses, and thus, in his lifetime, his barometer was never reinstalled in the town square. This experience partially explains why Torricelli turned to the use of mercury, so that he could make a smaller barometer that could be used out of sight, so scientifically ignorant people would not draw the wrong conclusions. You see, correlational evidence is not scientific evidence. Science requires independent experimental testing. Lastly, if you think the preceding two examples are unique one-offs, I'll give you one more example where you probably will know someone who believes this. Getting caught in the rain makes you sick. They might have all sorts of data and correlational examples, but in this case, their collection of the data is faulty. They only collect the data that seems to prove their point. They remember getting caught in the rain because that is a memorable event. And then they remember getting sick because that too is memorable. But they forget shaking hands with the person who had a cold. Perhaps that person was hiding the symptoms with antihistamines or such. And thus, that is not very memorable. Then they forget rubbing their eyes or nose or touching their face because they do that all the time. It is an unconscious habit. But what they did out of their awareness is collect a bacteria or virus from touching someone or something. And then they introduced that virus or bacteria to their mucous membranes when they touched their eyes, nose, or face. You see, the reality is that people do not get sick from the rain. Instead, people get sick from viruses and germs. Many people have run experiments that prove this. Yet even today, much of society believes they get sick from the rain. And it is even possible to find pop magazines that will tell you the rain can make you sick, just like people used to believe you could get polio from swimming in cold water. I could go on all day about this. The news is often filled with many examples that mistake correlational evidence for scientific evidence, along with folks that make excuses for why data should be ignored because it does not agree with their theories. Thus, if you are working with a data scientist and they claim a correlation is proof of something, remember they are wrong. 
one must then run an experiment where you actually manipulate the thing you think is controlling the output and see if you are actually controlling the output. Only then will you really know what is happening. We have covered a lot of territory in this module. Let's summarize the key points of data science at statistics. First, we need statistics to help our brains manage large sets of data, because our brains are not good at drawing true and correct conclusions by simply looking at the raw data. Statistics has a tremendous power to persuade, and some people abuse this power to lie with statistics. The difference between comfy statistics that are typically used for deception and true statistics is that true statistics are open for examination and can be independently reproduced. A true statistic tells us about the shape of the data. What is the significant point about the data? And how does the data vary about the significant features? And how certain are we that this data represents the overall population? It also includes the method for collecting the data so that others can independently reproduce and confirm our results. True statistics lend themselves to review, study and questioning by reporting all these components. Lastly, data science is a science. For the use of statistical tools, this means that data science brings rigor and processes to the use of these tools. Specifically, the scientific method requires that one test the statistically formulated hypotheses. If one cannot create an experiment by which one can test the hypothesis, then the conclusions are just statistical or correlational. They are not scientific. If the experimental results disagree with the hypothesis, then a true scientist does not make excuses for the data, but rather a true scientist returns to the study of the problem to develop new and better hypotheses for explaining the new data resulting from the experimental evidence. Statistical evidence and correlational evidence, regardless of how good or how elegant, is not scientific evidence. Only results from independent testing can make that assertion. And even then, all you are doing is finding experiments that support the hypothesis at hand. A true data scientist lets the data, experiments, and results defend the hypothesis or conclusions. A true data scientist never needs to intimidate or obfuscate anything. The valid use of data science at statistics is represented by openness that enables all to be enlightened in the pursuit of truth. We have covered a lot in these three sections. And even so, this is, of course, only a brief overview of the concepts behind data science at statistics. Much more study will be required for you to develop a skill in this field. But the hope is this section will have given you some skill that will help you better manage the use of data science and statistics in your pursuits. If you have any questions on a limited basis, I will try to field your questions via email or such. I have enjoyed sharing this material with you. Thanks for your time. I hope you have found it enjoyable too. I look forward to talking with you again soon.